Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Kennedy, and it's my pleasure today to introduce David Schwaterer, who's going to talk to us about innovation in business today. Uh, David's the author of a number of technical books, and uh, you should Google him and find out more. Very interesting man to talk to, and I'm sure he'll welcome your questions uh, both at the end of the presentation and, and if you want to talk to him afterwards. So please welcome David Schwaterer. <laughs> It is a distinct pleasure to be here today, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to start off by thanking Google. You are my homepage. I use your maps extensively. I gave Google mail. I just love, I Google, you know, inventors stuff. Uh, it, it, your open source project and open office, I'm looking forward to that hitting the street. I've got a, a, a Vandu system coming in that's got open source on it for the first time in my life. Uh, it's your, your, your consciousness in data center efficiency. Uh, I've actually quoted your work uh, that's come out, your, your analysis on disk drive failures. I do a lot of writing about disk data storage. Currently the editor-in-chief of the Symantec Technology Network, and I put out a newsletter to 120,000 people every month across the world and a number of articles. So if you would like to be internationally published, there's some way for Google and Symantec to do this together. I am your guy. I'm your go-to guy. Uh, so let's, um, let's move on. We're going to have a lot of fun in this presentation. Um, we don't have time to explain that particular picture there, but you might be able to figure it out from crossing the chasm. And we all arrive here in, in stations in life with expectations. Now my expectation, and I'm going to do my level best to deliver on it, is, is that this is going to be fun, this is going to be exciting, and it's going to be interactive, sort of like this YouTube Google, uh, the YouTube video. Have you seen this, Joe, Joe, Joe Satriani, Google of, of uh, one? Oh, you got to see this one. And, and I'm formally asking uh, Google if they would please put the YouTube video that this will be right next to this guy's because I want to look over the cyber fence and ask him how he does all of his great guitar. He's one of the greatest guitar players in the world. So the other expectation I have is this will be an interactive presentation. I will ask the audience questions and I will get answers. Okay, I got a lot of heartbeats to spin. So that said, uh, what are your expectations? Somebody just yell out, just a, just a few. What do you guys want? You, what, do you, what did you think was going to happen when you came here today? Learning and what else? Fun? Entertainment? Diversion? Food? Cafeteria? All right, there you go. OK. OK, good. All right, well, we're going to try and meet all of those. And we're going to kick it off with a little fun now that we've established a little interactivity. I've got a Chris $20 bill here. That's right to the first person that can identify what is going to appear on the screen right now, okay? You gotta yell it out. No guts, no glory. One call, one close, call early, call off, and call at the top, right? Take a stand, you ready? Here it comes. What is it? Here's your hand. Okay, who, who was first? You, okay, all right. C can I bother you to, can I bother you to stand up? Okay. <laughs> you see, it's called an audience victim. Bear with me. You're doing great. You're really doing Just bear with me on this. Okay. Now, in a word, the answer is no. It's not a hair dryer. <laughs> but, but you get partial credit, okay, because, you know, it's, it's close. So here, this is a $20 bill, right? Okay. There you go. There's your $20. Okay. So there's your partial credit here. Now, there's a lot of smart people here at Google. I mean, like, everybody knows, right? A lot of smart people here. No, 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 no. Your public beating is not done yet. Okay, so a lot of people. So, do you know everybody here? You, I don't. You don't, right? And so, you answered, and maybe some of these people are snickering and saying, "Oh man, yeah." You know? Weren't you a little nervous about that? You know, maybe blurting something out, or, or were you just overpowered by that? I took a risk. Oh, you took a risk. Good. Okay. So. Uh, who did not hesitate? Everybody raise your hand who did not hesitate. OK, I didn't see everybody's hands go up, OK? So that means that there's some people here that hesitated. Guess what? When it comes to innovation, it helps to drop some defenses and go for the, go for the goal line right, right away. Take a stand in uncertainty, because he doesn't know me. So I'm going to reward that. 
OK. So now you've got half of it. You got 10 bucks worth. <laughs> so when you have an appraisal with a manager and he says, you did great on this, and you did great on this, and you did wonderful on this, what's the next three-letter word out of his mouth? But. but. OK, OK, but you didn't get it right. OK, what is it? Let's see if we can get it. It's a toe dryer. <laughs> That's what it is. I mean, this is, this is my toe dryer. I swim in the uh, Mountain View pool, and you know, I, what's, what's, what's in Mountain View stays in Mountain View, you know, in Las Vegas and stuff, you know, so I dry my toes. So that's what it is. Um, there's no way you could have gotten the answer right. Okay, but the point here is, is that when you look at something and you're an innovator, you're going to describe it with words. Your words will necessarily constrain the perceptions of what it is used for. Okay? Here is maybe a more suitable definition, electrically powered device that generates an optionally heated focused air stream. When you go into Target and you want one of these things, is that how you describe it? No. You say, I want a hair dryer. Okay. So what's going on here is, is we live in a very complex world. And I, and I don't like the word complex. Okay. We live in a multidimensional, fractal-based, nonlinear world with feedback loops that exhibits discontinuities, right? tectonic shifts, and effects of scale and time. So when you are trying to invent something, you've got to look at something differently than when you are asking to buy one. Because you do something different for efficient communication and bundled communication. What I just talked about is a very technique, a very common technique that Bert Rutan uses. He has no, no preconceptions on how things are used. When he needs a part for one of his airplanes, you know, like spaceship, you know, your spaceship guy out there, you know where he gets them? He goes to the junkyard, and he gets the switches and stuff out there. Okay, So pigeonholing, typecasting, stereotyping, that's the effect when you go in and you're communicating what you want. Okay, So your punishment for not getting it right is to accept the remainder of this on the condition that you will discuss these three words with somebody over a favorite beverage somewhere. Will you do that for me, please? You Would you please give this, this wonderful man a good hand? OK. A wonderful sport. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So for the rest of the audience that didn't cash in, you see those three words? The first person that yells bingo when they see them on a slide, one slide, they get 10 bucks. Hey. Okay. They all three have to be on the same slide? All three have to be in the same slide. So here we go. So my name is Dave Schwatter. I've got a number of books out. And I couldn't understand when I worked in IBM for 15 years how they could miss Ethernet, how they could miss TCP IP, how they could miss routing, how they could miss the web, and how they could miss the internet. You know? It only cost them $100 billion. And let me tell you, there were a lot of smart people in there you know, shaking trees and things like that. And, and I, was, I was leading the charge, some of it. So I began studying. 10 years ago intensively, change and resistance to change. And I have, I have studied innovation in these six disciplines here. Uh, the picture you see over there on the left, that is a gentleman writing about a 70-foot wave, impossible before 1992, very possible now. That was my first lecture at Stanford on the evolution of the surfboard. And it's, it's very fascinating. And I can come back here and do this one too. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a sports story. Uh, art, literature, music. Today, we are talking about industry. Now, we all took biology, right? Kingdom, phylum, order, class, family, genus, species, and you know, all that. The taxonomy here is innovation, innovation in industry, innovation in the aircraft industry, integration in the light aircraft industry, in, in the experimental light craft industry, and scaled composites in a Rutan aircraft factory and a specific project all the way down in the food chain called Flight of the Voyager. Incredible, successful. It's hanging in the Smithsonian with the Wright Flyer, the Bell X-1, Brooke Speets, you know, with, and with, <laughs> with our buddy up here, right? So uh, uh, hanging outside. So this is, this is the book called Voyager. It's out of print, but you can actually go to the pilot. He has a site, Dick Rutan. You'll see it on the next slide. And get a copy of this. It's fascinating reading. You can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, used books. 
uh, six bucks and get, a, and get one of these copies if you want. But um, it's pretty accurate. Lots of good information on there, and it's sort of the story. So if I can get my little puppy to work here. OK, so this is it. This is the Stanford Innovation presentation that I gave in January of this year. And I'm going to do it stock, as I did it at Stanford. But there's one more special Google slide, one more. Google bonus, okay, when it's done. So this is it. This is the Voyager. <laughs> You're never going to see an airplane like this again, let me tell you. And you'll understand why as we go through it. It was designed for one purpose, and that was to fly around the world on a single tank of gas without refueling, right, and land. Take, took off at Edwards Air Force Base, and it landed at Edwards Air Force Base. It happened a little over 20 years ago in December of 1986. Dick Rutan is the guy that tells it all best because he is the guy that flew it most of the time. There are only three people that flew this airplane, and uh, they probably had a tough time finding any other volunteers. Okay? So this is the agenda of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the principles, and all good startups right, have a wet napkin in a greasy spoon restaurant somewhere, and you know, pencil drawings on it, you know, compact computer started there, things like that. Um, Talk about that initial plan and then the test plan, phase one, test plan phase two, the flight, and then the conclusion. And what we're going to do here is we're going to learn about a startup. Because this is Silicon Valley startup stuff set in Modesto in an alien industry. And it's intentional that I do this because it's called lateral thinking. It is to start you off in a place that you are likely unfamiliar with and take you to a point you've never been. And, and so you're basically, most of you are defenseless at this point. You know nothing about this. So here we go. These are the principles. There's two of them to start with. The gentleman on the left is Dick Rutan. He's the pilot. He's the older brother of the gentleman on the right, who is Bert Rutan. Okay? So let's uh, find out a little bit about him. Dick Rutan, obsessed with flying. He got his, his, his uh, flying permit first, and then he went and got his driver's license the same day at age 16. He just loves to fly. I mean, this guy will fly anything. You know, can't keep him away. Decorated uh, aviation war hero. He was shot out of the air in Vietnam. He, he was on his third tour in Vietnam. The guy was, that was in the pilot seat went in too low. They got ground fire. Flames coming out of the airplane about 50 yards, and they had to kill the afterburner, and it shut off. And then the gas needles started going like this, and they said, we got to hit it again. And they hit the afterburner, and they shot up. Flames exploded out again, got over the coast, doing about Mach 1, and ran out of fuel. They ejected and came down. That was his last flight. He rotated back. He did another ejection in England, where somebody left an oil cap in the, in, in the oil pan and it blocked the oil, and the, the engine just blew up, and, and he got. So he's, he's seen the, and he got, he got injured on that second one there. So he retired from the Air Force. And one of the reasons why he retired from the Air Force is he's a maverick. He objected to the concept of a superior officer when people were really referring to senior officer. And there's great, great distinction there. And I admire him for, for recognizing that. Um, he is the right stuff in the Thomas Wolfe sense. He's this, this, is, this is a guy that will fly anything, anywhere, and, and probably live to tell about it. And he survives by a micro view. As a pilot, he knows he's going to die in a single thunderstorm cell over Denver. Right? It's going to be like real personal and real tightly focused in the way the wings are going to come off the airplane. Right? He loves acrobatic flying. He's, so he's, he, he's, a, he's a jet job. His younger brother is also obsessed with flying, but more on the design side. As a kid, he would go and pick up wrecked balsa wood model airplanes, and he'd rebuild his own airplane, and, it would, and, he, and he, was, he was a youth champion model airplane builder. He won so many times, he started moving the, fence, you know, the goal posts to try and keep him from winning. No one could beat this guy. So got a lot of really hardcore experience on model airplanes. And in fact, most of his airplane designs now are a direct result of his model airplane. They're just big model airplanes. Okay. Very prolific. Um, I think he has uh, 30 or 40 airplanes that have actually flown, 300 different designs. 
Uh, he works on lease costs. He, he, he admits he designs them on the toilet in the morning. You know, he just he seems to think that's, you know, you know, productive. So in the 70s, he founds Rutan Aircraft Factory, RAF, and he discovers he has absolutely no interest in customer base and mundane stuff. This guy's all about design and inventing. As soon as the thing is designed, he moves on to the next one and just and lets somebody else handle the details. Uh, doesn't want to worry about inventory, cost control, accounts receivable, any of that stuff. He, yeah, he's very prolific. He works in composites, which gives him a tremendous advantage in that when the design is wrong, he brings out a chainsaw. He just chains off the, you know, chainsaws off the wing. Right, he slams on some more foam core and he covers it up with graphite or fiberglass or whatever it is, and boom, he's back up in the air again. None of this six-month turnaround for aluminum molds and stuff like that. Uh, he is an avid Experimental Av uh, Aircraft uh, Association supporter, which is the group that sponsors home-built airplanes and a bunch of other things. He has a macro view. He says, you know, probably sometime next year, there's going to be a really big cold front that comes through from Canada down to Texas. And that's, you know, that's about his, his dealing with weather. Um, he hates acrobatics flying. So the problem here is, is that the younger brother is the boss of the older brother. Okay? They're both confident and stubborn. Older brother wants to be acrobatic and fly these, these little airplanes, which he calls Ferrari with wings down here in the bottom line, and uh, they stand, and so he quits. He says, okay, I quit. Can't take working here anymore uh, for you, Bert, and so he, he quits. And, uh, of course, that's the way it's going to work because the younger brother is the boss. Okay, there's a third person here. A third person is Jenny Yeager, and she's just a little 95-pound, teeny little thing dripping wet out of the shower. And the reason why that number is important is because they're going to fly around the world. And when you fly around the world, every transported pound that you fly around the world takes 2.6 gallons of gas that weighs 6 pounds per gallon. So that's 12 pounds, so it's 1,200 pounds to get her around the world. And you're going to need two people because you can't stay awake for, you know, five, six, eight, nine days to, uh, to fly this airplane. So, um, I have some handouts here which I can pass out, but over there on the left-hand side, these are just some of the designs that Bert Rutan has come up with. He's extremely prolific, you know, not, not all of them saw light of day. And um, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, this is the internals of one of these little airplanes that he designed, the Ford Canard airplane, very efficient, took the world by storm. Um, that said, with as much fun and games as all this stuff is, let's take a look here. There's somebody else at the table, and it's Sir Isaac Newton, right? And um, you can romanticize all you want, but the fact is, is that, you know, when you're doing your calculations, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, let's, we'll work out a few of them here. You guys bring your slide rules? Oh, oh, you know, you know. Uh, okay. All right, you work out some of the rules, you know, if the wing snaps off, uh, you know, it's the old story, the, uh, the 15,000 foot fall will not hurt you. You know, it's just sudden stop. And you won't live to tell about it. So you've got to get these things right. So, so what is this? Okay, so one plug for EAA is experimental airplanes can be very safe, but a bunch of people get killed after they have a safe one and they start experimenting, like with prop, prop pitch control motors and say, well, you know, we can fix that next time. And ah, no, you can't. Your airplane won't exist next time. And you're going to have two people in the air flying this airplane. It turns out there's a support crew of about 100 people. Let's meet some of them here. Okay? Larry Kasky, he's the guy that ran the control center. He did a really, really fine job. Bruce Evans, uh, he's a gentleman who actually built most of the Voyager working for Rutan Aircraft Carrier. Uh, our air aircraft company, uh, Burt Rutan's company. Mike and Sully Melville, those are Burt Rutan's partners. There's the, uh, uh, the, the flight uh, medical, Dr. George Elita. Jack Norris, he did the fuel calculations, which are very, very complex because it's a, calcul it's a calculus problem. You know, you got to get a bunch of fuel, and, and you're flying at a certain efficiency at this point, but after it's burned off, you're a little higher efficiency here, and you're burning less and burning less, and so there's this decay. And efficiency. Doug Shane, great pilot. Lynn Snellman, one of the greatest weathermen that ever lived. When these guys did this flight, they were wired into military satellite systems that were beaming down by the minute weather 
you know, satellite photographs, typhoons and weather clouds and thunderstorms and things like that. And last but not least is John Ronsk. And John Ronsk is one of the greatest aerodynamicists that has ever lived. And this guy, he built his own Heathkit computer as a kid, and he was doing laminar flow projections and lift and drag ratios and everything else. And he actually fixed a number of Burt Rutan's designs. And in fact, you know the Global Floor, uh, Global Flyer, right? The one that just went around the world in a jet, you know, Steve Fawcett and all that, right? A single guy, right? He did the aerodynamics on that, and it's one of the most uh, efficient and far-flying airplanes that has ever existed. It's miraculous almost made out of tissue paper, it's like. So you got two people in the air, you got a hundred on the ground. Okay. And that's generally what it takes. You got a few guys out on the rock band on stage, right? And you got a big crew moving everything around behind them. So it takes a lot. So here's the wet napkin. Dick, Na Dick resigns from Rutan Aircraft Factory and says, hey, got a plan, I want you to design an airplane for me that I can do acrobatics in and I can sell. And Bert says, uh, no way. You know, he's, he, he knows he's going to eventually get sued by people that get killed, whether there's a case or not, because in the United States, anybody can sue about anything. So he says, uh, it's an alternative. Why don't you just fly around the world on one tank unrefueled? You know, composites make it possible now. You can do it. It's the last thing that hasn't been done, uh, last great milestone. So they get talking, and he draws up a plan on a teriyaki-stained um, thinner napkin, and it starts right there. As luck would have it, here it is. There's basically the drawing. It is drawing uh, model number 76 because it's the 76th design that Bert had envisioned. Okay? Aspect ratio, 30-35 meters, really long and slender wings. Uh, that, that, that's impressive, you know, like the U2. Two place tandem. Two people are going to be in it, got to be. Oh, hey, look, the, the aft cockpit's a bed. So one person can be catching Z's while the other guy's flying. I love it. It's pressurized. So you're not going to need any oxygen. So you can get up real high and fly fast and you know, over the weather and all that good stuff. That sounds pretty good. The, um, the takeoff weight versus landing weight is 1.2. 80% of the airplane when it takes off is going to be fuel. That's, yeah, that sounds good. Carbon fiber, retractable gear. Of course, you know, don't want that drag. Those gears steerable. Got two engines, one in the front to, to, uh, you know, to pull it as a tractor, and the other one as a pusher. Stock ones, of course. You know, minimize risk. You've got a new airframe here, so let's minimize the, the power plant risk. Right? So minimize the new stuff. Really goes far. Biggest airplane, yep, 6 to 12 months. Hey, I'm impressed. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a plane that they call light and slippery. I mean, this thing is really, really classy. Um, oh, yeah, they have, a, they, have a, they have a plan. Look at this. They're going to build the airframe. Actually, they're going to have somebody build the airplane f airframe for them based on corporate donations that come in because they're going to put logos and stickers on it. So, you know, they're going to be funded. They're gonna, it's, man, it's a Cadillac. Uh, phase one, they're going to test to make sure it can fly right and it can go far enough. Phase two, they're going to install all the components, you know, all the radios and radars that turns out they need. They're going to fly the mission. I don't know. How about you guys? You know, it's, I'm pretty impressed here. I um, think we should declare victory now. I mean, look, all the elements are here, right? We've got experienced professionals, deep knowledge base, a design. We got a plan, right? Stretch goals, yeah. Oh, I like it. I like you. Okay, yeah. I, I want to hear you yelling bingo. Oh yeah, stretch goal. I mean, you know, all the elements are here, right? So it's just a small matter of execution. But being the you know uncertain person I am, I think we should ask Helmuth. What do you think? Want to ask Helmuth? Let's ask Helmuth. Okay, let's Helmuth say, oh, Field Marshal Helmuth von Moltke. 1860 general in the German army. No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. This is actually a misquote, by the way, and um, which is a whole nother lecture. So what changed? Oh, that great flying wing. Well, small problem. Didn't have enough fuel to get around the world. And even if it could, by the time it started getting to home base, if there was a breath of wind in the air, 
We'll just blow it away from the Air Force Base. So, I mean, like, uh -uh, yeah, eh, it's not going to work. OK, so got to do something else. So that's February of 81. Here's where we are. In March of 81, he says, OK, we're going to put some big pontoons out there, and we're going to fill those suckers up with gas. And, and now we got the gas. Right? And we'll have our two engines and, and everything. So, so this is, uh, uh, you know, this seems like a pretty good plan. So let me, um, uh, I brought some, some goodies here. And I, I want you to know that I'm, I, I'm not much of a, um, I'm not much of a model builder. And as it turns out, it's, it's also Russian plastic. So it's, uh, well, you don't want to pass it around with that. I, I don't want to do it. Here, here's, here's the missing wing, OK? Oh, I thought we weren't going to get that. Part. No, no, no. No, that didn't happen in the, in the actual flight. So he passed it around. You had to stick it in. And you give you an idea of what this thing looks like. Well, it's pretty slick. And, well, OK, I feel a lot better now. Maybe, you know, maybe they're going to make it. What do you think? OK, well, let's see here. Uh, we will move on. OK, so we're passing around the model here. Came from Russia. I got three of these. They're very hard to get. <laughs> Plastic is terrible. Oh, other wet napkin plan changes. I, oh, I wonder what, what this is. They were going to get major sponsor money. Let's see. They'll be the path to our door. And this is Kevin Cosner, Field of Dreams stuff. 18 months went by. I called everybody. Nobody cared. Right? <laughs> we were so naive. So there's only one option. It's what your founders did in the garage right over in Palo Alto, right? right? You know, they went and got a bunch of cheap motherboards and slammed them together, and they bootstrapped it up, and they, they went over and talked to Andy Bechtelsheim. Good guy, really good guy. And uh, so they got, OK, so they, they, so they started bootstrapping. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is, I think it's going on right now. There's a big EAA convention, airplane convention, in Oshkosh. You probably heard about it. So they flew there. And that's them coming in. And there's a story about that flight com of them coming in. And they're out there to petition for money. And if you look carefully over there, sort of in the middle left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the airplane out there with throngs of people around it. And these people go gaga. Right? If you look over the right-hand side of the screen, you see all those little Ys? Well, those are all the other Burt, Burt Rutan airplanes. Right? So you know the very easy, the long easies, and things like that. So like these guys were real well known. They were they're rock rock heroes when they show up, and particularly with this airplane. So here comes some of the money. They get one for two dollars. It says, well, "Give it your best shot. We're betting on you. Don't laugh. I don't get lunch today." So they funded a two million dollar project back in 1886 on. $2 and $100 donations and things like that. And uh, uh, this is what you want. I, when you guys indexed my lecture on digital image processing that I gave at computer literacy back in 1998 or so, I said, Google is really good. These guys are going to make it. Because you didn't. So you had me. I was a Roy G. Tuck back then. So all right. So these guys are scrounging around, and they do get a few fabulous sponsors. They really do. Um, Hercules for some of the uh, carbon composite uh, work, and um, 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 some other people you'll see later on. They said, OK, somebody else is going to build the plane? Yeah, yeah, right. They're going to build the plane. Right? So there they are. Now that's Bruce Evans over there on the left-hand picture. And he's a Rutan Aircraft Factory employee for, on, working for Bert, uh, Bert Rutan. And the other picture there is there he is again, along with uh, Dick Rutan. And they're building part of the, uh, looks like uh, probably the, uh, one of the pods there. And you've got um, Jenna Yeager over there building another part there. So they actually are out there, got quarter inch Nomex honeycomb stuff. And they're laying down two three thousandths of an inch carbon fibers at 45 degree angles in the top and the bottom. And there are no fuel tanks in this airplane because the inside of every, all of the cavities are sprayed to be fuel resistant, and they are the fuel tanks. Okay. So what do we have here? Ah, good. OK, now we're all engineers here. So I was getting a little nervous. But you will be pleased to know that they observed the internationally accepted TLAR engineering aircraft construction standards. Does anybody know about the TLAR? Uh, that stands for that looks about right. And they did swags. Uh, there are very, very few formal drawings. 
right? So this was engineering on the fly. And it was uh, yeah, pretty good engineering. Oh boy, those cockpits are going to be pressurized with no O2. Uh-oh, it's not going to be pressurized. O2 is going to be required. They're going to have to carry very heavy tanks. So rather than carry three tanks for oxygen, what they do is in one tank they put three times as much as they should, so they have, they, they have uh, you know, potential projectile oxygen canisters you know, you know, like four feet away from them at all times. And because they're flying low, it's now going to add three days. The flight was going to take six days, and now we have a 50% mission overrun. I wonder if that makes a difference when you've been up there. I don't know. OK, gosh, OK. Oh, yeah, you're going to fly west to east. Well, it turns out that the, you know, the global trade winds and everything go the opposite direction. So Lynn Snellman saved him on that. And it turns out, here's a factoid for you. Spring it on somebody at lunch that hasn't been here. Did you know? You know, you got the equator. There is more land mass exposed above north of the equator than south of the equator. Turns out they're going to fly in December. And because of the inequity of the distribution of land mass, the, the uh, convection currents come up from the south hemisphere to the north. And just all blazes break out over, uh, over Africa when they're going to be trying to do their mission. So they know. They've been warned. There is no way you can get across Africa. Forget it. It's just every day, it's just it's absolutely insane. So. Well, they have, at least they're going to, well, no, it doesn't look like they're going to have lots of interior room. They cut it down to about the size of a telephone booth for two people. And um, there's no soundproofing because they can't afford the weight for soundproofing. So a few feet behind them, they've got a motor. And a few feet in front of them, they've got a motor. And um, they're going to lose their hearing. Okay? And the physiological thing. But there it is. That's the cockpit. That's it. One person lays down, and then the other one flies. Okay? You got Dick there, and this is Jenny Yeager, and that's it. That's, that's all the room there is in this thing for nine days. So, uh-oh. It looks like, in addition to some plan changes, we got some surprises. I wonder what these are. Well, OK, we couldn't afford the weight penalty of, of, of insulating and putting the wire mesh in to get rid of the static dischargers. And so in things like empty fuel tanks, you've got static electricity shooting, you know, kaboom, right? <laughs> oh, that's impressive. Smoke, sm fuel fumes come out in the airplane. They, they never track down where these fuel fumes. Smoke comes out of the panels and things like that. Very strange. Their fuel lines start rotting on them. That flight that they did to Oshkosh, they kind of like grabbed some motorcycle motors and stuck them in there for you know, a temporary power plant. Well, they off-gassed some acid, and they got in there. And they're all rotting away and getting ready to leak. So they cut them out where they could see them. But by now, they went way out into the wings and in places you couldn't get to at this point. So you got to hope now. Did they get it all? Well, OK. They put one rudder in rather than two. And the reason why they did that is they want to save weight. And that's it. It's over there on the, um, uh, I guess that's the starboard side of the airplane, if you were a, a nautical. Right? Uh, it, yeah, it saved a pound. Right? Every pound you save is three and a half pounds of fuel. So um, what they discovered also that the vertical tails, even for level flight, were marginal. Barely keep the thing in a straight line. It was just like wandering all over the air, this thing. If you wanted to turn it, ha, good luck. So what does that mean? Highly compromised for range, asymmetric handling. You could turn right easier than you could turn left because you only had one rudder and it wasn't on the center line. Okay? Well, that sounds kind of, you know, gee, I wonder. Uh-oh, the canards. Those are the little wings up front, you know? They have tremendous loading on them. Don't get the canards wrong. Airplanes just fall right out of the sky. Uh, John Rontz fixed some of the canard designs for Vert Rutan when they flew in the storms. And it's called perturbation theory when the laminar flow gets in disrupted, you know, epsilon distance away from the, um, uh, the surface of your airfoil. So they had to go in and they had to stick vortex generators in to, to create turbulence to break up the, the, the uh, the, the laminar flow disruption was too close to the leading edge. Okay, 
John Rounce did that. Very, very good work. Very good guy. Okay. Bert's comment was, don't fly in the rain. Yeah, kind of fly around the world. Don't fly in the rain. Okay. All right. Adverse yaw and dihedral effects. And what that means is, is you try and turn the airplane, but it starts turning into spaghetti. And as soon as you let go of the wheel, it just, it just comes back. Because the airplane's bent, and it just, it just, it just comes back. So it's, it's a miserable handling airplane. Uh, Bert says, uh, Dick, it's mission adequate. It's world flight. Doesn't have to turn at all. You get in it, you go around, and you come out. OK. OK. So they learn on the Oshkosh flight, hey, radar and oxygen is absolutely essential. And Dick Bert says, no, it's not. Well, unfortunately, it was. So they had to put in the extra weight, and they put it up there in the starboard uh, front pod there. OK. Incredible noise in the cockpit. They had 16 fuel tanks that they bled very carefully into a feeder tank. And then the feeder tank went to the engines. And they were constantly siphoning fuel out of these tanks. It was so time consuming that they had, what was it? Um, six minutes an hour idle time. 54 minutes per hour for both of them were spent handling fuel, reporting, doing everything else. This is a nine day flight, six minutes an hour time off. Okay. Uh, the cockpit wasn't put on the center line of the airplane. It was put off to the right so that people could move around inside. And so it was on kind of an angle like that. So if you tried to straighten it up, you know, the wings were going like that, and you weren't flying straight. So you, 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 very easy to, 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 to get vertical. Dick's comment was, well, you only have to live 48 hours after the world flight. And if you live any longer than that, then we've wasted something, obviously, for, for, for range capacity. OK. Oh my god, there's more surprises in phase one. OK, so if you go define colon Voyager you know, in the Google search page, you get uh, 17 compartments, sealed, flexible, flying fuel bladder containing 3.5 tons of explosive fuel surrounding two potential incineration candidates. Oh yeah, oh yeah, this, this, is, this has got a lot of fuel here. OK, and worse, worse, oh my gosh, I actually forgot it. It's in my car. Um, Above 82.5 knots, there was an induced amplification, uh, uh, ampli uh, uh, amplified wiggle in the airplane. It's called air elasticity. And I actually had a model. Um, that's it there. It's, I call it my uh, uh, Voyager Pentagon general training aim. And if you grab it in the center spar and you, and you pull it up and down, the wings flap up. But also, at the same time, the nose flaps up. And when that happens, this becomes a control surface along with the canards. And so then the airplane starts porpoising, and it becomes divergent. Um, got any Stanford mechanic, or any mechanical engineering students here? All right? OK. Google test. Look familiar? All right? That's what we're talking about here. All right? Above 82.5, if you did not hop onto these oscillations within 15 seconds, your airplane was toast, and you shortly thereafter. So, so they said, OK, let's fix this. And uh, the way they fix things, typically with these airplanes, is with Band-Aids. So they raised the main gear, which is the back one, and they lowered the front landing gear. And oh, by the way, the landing gear was only built to sustain 10 smooth landings. And they were probably up to, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK, maybe we could now. Well, this is too rigid. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, OK, well, that's that's. <laughs> Speak of the devil. OK. So they fixed the failing. Uh, so they had to fix the front, front wheels, too, at the same time. Because the thing is, uh, wait. So consensus is it's a fundamentally unsafe airplane. It's a death trap. We're going to do this thing, and we are never going to fly this thing again. These are very experienced pilots. You know, Dick Rutan, he thought it was going to kill him. And, and uh, well, you know, it really did. OK. Oh, now in phase two, when they're putting in the instruments, there's some more changes to the plan here. Let's see. New plane design. Oh, they were going to use those two proven engines? Well, a new one and a super good one appeared. And it was for a spy airplane. And the spy airplane now is hanging up in the Hiller, Hiller Air Museum in San Carlos. It's the big one. It's called the Condor. It's all the way up in the ceiling. It's got two of these engines. Incredibly efficient. Uh, you got 13 less horsepower out of it, but because they were so efficient, 
it eliminated 2,000 pounds of fuel, which is pretty important, as you'll see. So they said, OK, we're going to go with this, with this new guy here. Ah, uh, here's a winning decision. You're trying to minimize the weight on your airplane, right? Because all that gasoline to haul the stuff around. So you go after really lightweight wooden propellers from Europe. Go to the glider guys, right? That's good. OK. Well, it didn't quite work out for reasons you'll see in the next slide. They had to replace those with metal propellers that weighed 70 pounds more, but they were 3 to 5% more efficient. And so what was happening here was they were optimizing on the wrong independent variable, weight versus a fish, you know, delivered efficiency. And they discovered this, and they fixed it. So very easy mistake to make. Six to 12 months required. It took them six years to do this. It's a small matter of a five-year overrun on a one-year plan. Okay? Okay. It's going to be nine or ten test flights, 67 test flights before they did the world flight. So, you know, they're off by a factor of six or seven. Right? The landing gear designed for ten smooth landings. Okay. All right. Now, they lost their prop. Now, naive me, I thought a prop was, you know, like one of these wooden things that you kind of like screw onto a shaft and you're done, like a tire. Wrong. This is what a prop is. It's this complex. All kinds of stuff in there. You've got the variable pitch props. You've got motors that are changing the pitch of the props and, the, you know, electrical and everything else. A lot of stuff involved in that. This is a non-trivial change. This is sort of like saying, oh, Instead of x86, we've got to use spark processors. Oh, OK. It's a big change here. So Vandenberg, they had an emergency landing on one of their endurance runs. And, and an impossible, a problem that was supposed to be impossible happened. They lost control of their prop pitch motor. Okay? They landed down there. They reached up, and they grabbed it, and it fell apart in their hands. When it happened, um, the, rin, the rear engine was windmilling. And they discovered that if your front engine was not working and your rear engine was windmilling and they couldn't feather it because they had it, the alternative was using it as a brake, that the airplane could not stay in the air. You needed that rear engine to stay in the air. No rear engine, you're in the water. So they learned that. They find out with the electrical prop pitch motors, they're rated for 100 degrees centigrade. It's, they're running at a more than 150. They're running at, it's supposed to be at 9 volts, running at 28 volts. They say, time out. This is not going to work. So uh, they swap it out. The pitching problem, this porpoising stuff, increases as they start adding fuel for distance. It gets worse and worse. Um, they did an uneven touch up on one of the uh, uh, ailerons up in the canard. And just a little bit of paint got on the back versus the front, and it went into a flutter. A flutter is what kills airplanes in about two seconds. It just, and it's gone. Your ailerons are gone, and you're, and you're out. So they discovered that. Electrical system, out of control. It was, it was a hack job. They knew it. Alternator failed on them. Um, it was a, you know, they managed to get that landing gear. Bolts were breaking. The lead in fuel, airplane fuel, fouls the spark plugs. These guys are going for hundreds of hours. You're supposed to swap out your park, spark plugs every 25. Right? There's no place up in you know, 15,000 feet to change your spark plugs. So they wind up getting really good ones from Champion. They had to move to, on the rear engine, they had to go water-cooled versus air-cooled. And when they did that, they discovered that the radiators they had to build were, had to be much bigger than all of the formulas described. And by the way, this happened to the Wright brothers, too. They were going along trying to build their airplanes. They couldn't understand why they didn't get enough lift. The answer was, <laughs> formulas were wrong. So they went in and they did their own formulas. So we're going to lose here. So all kinds of problems with the wooden propeller. So they went to the, uh, the heart cell, and uh, it was, a, it was a, a, just a a Trojan, Trojan effort to get it done. It was done. They required emergency assistance from the National Business Aircraft Association. They came right through and they did it. Dick discovers in his flights he can't sleep in this airplane. But he feels he has to fly. Now, the problem here is now the clock is ticking. And they get, they're getting money in donations, but 
they're going to start losing them and they're going to have to return all of their equipment. And so they're under pressure, just like the, um, uh, the launch was for the shuttle. Right? They saw that happen, by the way. They say, okay, that's it. They fix everything they can. And they live by the maxims of airplane will never be totally ready, right? Is software ever really completely debugged? Right? Nah, you know, it's kind of good enough, and let's go for it. Uh, the weather will never be as good as you want. It's called uncertainty. And they proceed in the face of uncertainty. Here they are, December 14th. They're out on the hammerhead at Edwards Air Force Base. If you look carefully in those circles there, those are sawhorses underneath the wingtips because they're filling up the tanks and the wings with all this fuel they're starting to settle. No problem, they stay off the ground. They stay about that far off the ground. So it gets ready to do their run and they remove, the, they remove it and they spin it around and they start the props. And also you'll see the, uh, that yellow hose there. They are de-icing because there's frost. They can't afford the disruption of the airflow, laminar airflow over the wings, and the weight of the frost. And so they're spending most of the night out there. OK, so this is Dick. He says, Edwards Tower, it's the Voyager 1, sir, we're ready to go. Voyager 1, this is Edwards Tower. ATC clears Voyager 1 from Edwards Air Force Base to Edwards Air Force Base via flight plan, maintain 8,000. Cleared for takeoff. Godspeed. And they're going to need it all. Because here we go. Now they're rolling. Structural weight of the composites was 934 pounds. It is lifting 10.38 times that weight. Right? The people, the engines, the electronics, the wires, the lights, and things like that, that's 2,683 pounds. Dick Rutan, on the fly, just a hunch, just added an extra 354 pounds of fuel more than was called for in the flight plan. Takeoff weight of fuel is 7,000 plus pounds of highly explosive gasoline. I mean, this stuff burns like you've never seen. Okay. Fuel fraction 72.3%, slightly lower than what they thought they were going to do. The weight of the fuel was put so much stress on the airplane, it warped the entire frame. When they handed him the canopy, he couldn't screw it in. He had to pound it into place with his hand because the actual fuselage had warped at this point. He's thinking, boy, this really looks dumb. We're all fueled up, and I can't even get the canopy on. Okay? <laughs> so he starts rolling. Well, you know, as it turns out, those boom tanks that are out there, they have more fuel in it than normal. And their you know, their, um, you know, moment, you know, their, their physics moment, right? It's ahead of their uh, fulcrum there, and so it's pushing down now. Okay? The airplane is literally is just taking off, trying to fly right into the concrete. The wings that were about that high off, so they start taking off, they start dropping as the airplane tries to go right into the concrete. Okay? And the wingtips dragged. They probably drug for over a mile. This is a plastic airplane plastic around foam. Right? Dick says, I reached up and grabbed the stick, started easing back. I said to myself, Dick, if you've ever been smooth in your life, you better be smooth right now, because this is the big one. And it was. Two minutes and 14 seconds it took for the airplane to lift off. They set their first record on the runway. <laughs> along 14,200 feet, right? 800 feet is a, it's the longest concrete runway in the world. They almost used it all. Well, what's that all about? Well, they were flying 15% heavier than they had on their last flight. They added uh, 1,264 pounds of fuel. It over doubled the takeoff distance. So they were above the bend in the exponential curve at this point. Bert Rutan says, Instead of 15, if it had been 20 to 25, there would have been a fireball down at the end of the runway. Would not have been able, to, probably, to get off the, the ground. Okay. So a mile or so, these wingtips drag, and um, it takes its toll. But now it's in the air. 
first thing that happens is, is they're up in the air and they have to wiggle the airplane and they have to break off the winglets because they're there flopping around. And they don't know what else is going to go off with the winglets. And there's also fuel vent lines that are out there. Uh, but the weight of the airplane is so heavy that it's bent up like this, and so it's not going to be venting out. And no fuel will be venting out on it, as it turns out. So up to this point, they had flown at 354 hours with six emergency landings, like right now here. Okay? So okay. their flight plan is for 255 nonstop hours with no landings, heading out immediately over the longest transoceanic flight possible in the world, California to Hawaii. Okay. Not a lot of life, rap, life rafts out there. They have been warned repeatedly, December is the worst weather. You will not be able to get across to Africa. They said, we got to do it because we're going to lose our funding if we don't. So it's now or never. Okay. There is no route. None. There is no way that's planned. There's no certitude in this. They're going to be receiving weather updates every six hour and path recommendations. The priorities in the path recommendations is favorable winds, meaning tailwind. Next sorting criteria, collating criteria, is how good is the weather. They'll take bad weather over good weather if it means better wind. Okay? The other one is politically sensitive area. You fly over places like Chad and things like that. You know, they got missiles that are shooting down airplanes and helicopters and everything else over Lake Victoria. So it's a, it was a real problem. When they got over Africa, they got over the coast of Africa, they turned off their transponder. So they lost their winglets right over California. They only found one of them. And the other one's out there somewhere. And there's a 6% additional drag now, meaning they just lost 1,500 miles. Of range. So now they've seriously eroded into their safety distance. There is their flight path right out of the book. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the exciting things that happened here. Okay. They lost their wingless, their, their noise suppression headsets fail, their critical needle on a critical gauge falls off and just, just it's just vibrated to death. Maybe. Okay. Okay. They um, they Hit a, hit, a, hit a typhoon. And what's, what, you know, it's favorable winds, right, over weather. What do they do? They pull as close as they can into this typhoon, and they go right between the rain bands, and they let them slingshot them through. That's right. And they had to do it really, really carefully, because there's a low front coming down from China, and it closed right, you know, like within a half an hour behind them. So they were doing that. So they get to the point where they can turn off the front engine, because the front engine was only there to get the airplane up in the air. And once it could, the back engine could fly, that was real efficient, and they would turn off the front engine. So they try and turn it off based on the fuel they know they have consumed. The airplane starts sinking. They've got to turn it back on again. Oh, I don't understand what that's all about. Um, so Gina takes over and flies. Dick absolutely blows out. He, he, he's just. He, he, you know, he's been up for like two and a half days, three days, flying nonstop, and they're still not below 82.5 knots. And Dick is a superb pilot. Jenna is not as good as Dick, so he just, uh, there's, there's no choice. So they, they, they finally get it onto one engine somewhere around, oh, golly, that looks like, what, um, Malaysia. Okay, and then after, shortly after Malaysia, they get it below 82.5 knots, and so now they're relatively safe. And they're running along, and they notice just over the, uh, the Indian Ocean, it's the Indian Ocean or the Arabian Sea or something, coolant is leaking into their oil. That's right. This is, this is showstopper time. You know, this is like power from the dam just dropped you know, you know, up in the Columbia River. So they're pretty upset about that, but it seems not to be too big of a problem. On critical instruments, the light bulbs start burning out. And they'll take another light bulb for another instrument, put it in, boom, it'll burn out. Because it's a hooked up electrical system in this thing. Okay. Well, they get over Africa, and mission control says, look, it's really bad. Be, you're going to hit the worst weather in Africa. So why don't you hang out there over the coast a while, and everything will be cool. And uh, they don't get that message. Right? You know, when Francis Drake Colonel Evan Drake was, was drilling in, in Titusville. The guys that were funding him said, stop, stop the oil drilling, right? Stop the oil drilling because we've run out of money. Right? The 
letter took an extra day to get there. The day that it didn't get there is the day they discovered oil. So it's the same kind of thing here. They noticed that the fuel was flowing backwards to the source tanks. And they'd been calculating all of their fuel consumption based on this uh, transducer. But transducers don't care whether the fuel is flowing forward or backward. And so they would load up the, the header tank, and then it would start flowing back. So they had a lot more fuel. And they began to realize, wait a minute, that's why we couldn't turn off our engine. Maybe we're going to make it here. So they go over Lake Victoria. They slide right through thunderstorms and everything else. They get on the other side. Dick blows out, lays down, and he says, Gina, for heaven's sakes, wake me up when we get to this, when we get to this point here. She doesn't do it, and he wakes up you know, sometime later, and he looks, and he says, where are we? He says, oh, we're past that point. And he says, look at the radar screen. It's all red because they're just about ready to be a lawn dart inside of Mount Cameroon. And if you look at here, if you look at Mount, Mount Cameroon near Miss, they almost hit that. They're out over the ocean. Now they're punch drunk because they're tired, sleep deprivation. Instead of pumping oil into the oil tank, apparently they pumped it out, not realizing what they were doing. They hadn't set the valve. And they almost lose the engine. Mobile synthetic oil potentially saved the airplane and their lives. Okay? They get it back up. Now, when all the weather breaks loose in the wintertime along the equator, it's called the intertropical conversion zone. ITCZ, and in the dark, over there near South America, a large block of storms broke off and drifted south, and they hit them. And it flipped the airplane right on its side. Dick actually thought it was going to go over. Now, this is a piece of tissue paper with a couple of motors on it that can maybe go like that, but this is now like this. And because he was a supremely gifted pilot, he was actually able to nudge it back in out of full vertical and bring it around. Shortly thereafter, it completely melts down and collapses. <laughs> OK. So they hit the Caribbean, and things are looking pretty good. They're pretty sure they're going to make it now. So what they do is, is they hit the throttle. They really start burning the gas, because the slower you go, the better your fuel efficiency because there's, you know, you know, what is it, one half kV squared and friction and all that other stuff. So they're drifting in, and the big one hits. Engine out. Now, this is the second time this slide has seen it. You guys are engineers, so you're going to understand this. Okay. Top of the slide is the front of the airplane. It has a motor that has been turned off for a week. It is cold, it is feathered, and it requires a complex process to unfeather it, a hydraulic process. The back engine is um, the really efficient one. It does not have a starter, because this is going to run all the time, and you, you prop it. You, know, you pull on the prop, and you start this thing. And uh, uh, rather than feather it, you can use it as a brake. So that's the trade-off there. And you've got these, these things, these diamonds with eights in it. Those are eight-way selector tanks. And this is where you set where you want your fuel to come from when you're tapping it in to go to the header tank. Okay? Every motor has a mechanical pump, plus it's assisted by an electrical pump that does two things. It clears the fuel line of bubbles and air so that you can start the engine, plus it also does the pumping of the fuel into the header tank. Okay? And you've got two-way selector tank, depending on whether or not you're going to be pulling your fuel in from the header tank or from the tanks directly in the case there's a problem. Yeah, it's a little complicated. And the header tank is 42 uh, gallon capacity. There are nine gallons in it. They know they need 28 to get there. Got to find 19 gallons. No problem. Look, out on the tip cell tanks there, which are the last guys to go, and you know, they're. They've all been up there. There's 29.3 gallons. So they trip the solenoid over on the, um, the, uh, the left-hand tank to let the tip cell drain, drain into tank 8. They set the selector switch over there. And they're going to get their 29.3, which is going to be 10 gallons more than what they need to get home. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I was getting nervous there. Small problem. Tank has been leaking the entire trip. There aren't 29.3 gallons in there. There are 8.1 gallons. OK, well, we're almost there. Yeah, we're about 11 gallons short here now. Oh, look, there's 
29.3 over in the other guy there. Okay? Set the eight-way selector switch to go to you know, tank eight, you flip the solar cell, and hit that electrical pump over there. Uh-oh. It just burned out. <laughs> and now that gasoline is all marooned over there. Right? So Dick says, all right, all right, we've got a backup plan here. We're going to invoke that, that number two thing there, and rather than pull, pull gasoline from the, the header tank directly, we're going to go out and we're going to pull it from the tanks over on the right-hand side because they have gleaned everything out of the left-hand side. So he activates it. There's your bypass. And he goes up and he starts pulling off of the front canard tank. He gets distracted. The fuel line fills with air. To start the engine, he has to reprime the engine. Guess what reprimes the engine? The dead electrical pump. The mechanical pump does not have enough suction to clear the fuel line. What happens to the rear engine? Let's see if I can get it here. It immediately stalls. Here's, here, here's the sound effect now. That's what it sounds like in the plane. It's slowly spinning to the right because there's more fuel over there on the right-hand side, and they don't have six hands to level the airplane. They're trying to figure out what to do, and it's spinning in, and they're going to die. They are going to die now. Okay. Why are they going to die? Because Vandenberg told them if they start the front engine and the back engine is windmilling, the front engine doesn't have the power to pull the airplane. They learned that in Vandenberg. They're going to die. Okay. Well, Dick does what he can. He tries to pump it. He can't get that rear engine going. And he says, OK, we got to do something. Let's start the, rear, let's start the front engine. The front engine hasn't been started for a week. It takes three hands to hold it. He's, like he's got his elbows here. And he's, he's pumping stuff here. And he's getting the hydraulic pressure up to unfeather the thing. And he hits it, and he hits it, and he hits it, and bam, it starts. But it's cold. And they have no options. And they pull the full power unwarmed up. It stays. The airplane is putting along. And now they have delayed their deaths a couple of minutes. But suddenly, Dick notices that the airplane is accelerating. And what had happened at Vandenberg was they were high altitude with a lot of fuel. And now they're low altitude with very little fuel. And indeed, the front engine can pull the airplane. And he's sitting there thinking, oh my. And he pulls back on the yoke, and he over-rotates, and the airplane goes up in the air about like that. And guess what happens? Fuel runs down the line to the rear tank, which doesn't have a starter. But it's windmilling, right? Wham, it starts. And now he's got two engines. OK? He's got two engines. And so they go in and they swap out the bad fuel pump with the good fuel pump. They load it up, and they're going to make it now. They're coming in. Here they are, coming in. Boy, those wingtips look just a little beat up. Wouldn't you like to get a close look up at those? They were just pretty beat up. They used to have winglets on it. So they're coming in now. and. Dick uh, you know, knows that he'd taken off nine days before, and Edwards Air Force Base is a very busy Air Force Base, and you, know, you better beg to land there because it is a top secret facility. So he calls in. He says, uh, Edwards, Voyager 1, we're about 20 minutes out. And I know you guys are busy, but you just kind of like let us come in and like land out in the dry lake bed so that the two or three guys that are there to take pictures can take the pictures. And we promise we'll stay out of your way as much as possible. Voyager's Edwards Tower, we canceled flying for today, and we're all here waiting to meet you. <laughs> there they are. There's 40,000 people, the sponsors, are waiting. They had absolutely no idea. And they're flying around, 
And they're saying, you know, we ought to give these guys a show, right? You know, they, they came out here. It's cold. Everything's December, right? They're flying around. And meanwhile, Reagan, back in Washington, is looking at his TV set and said, will they land the damn thing? Please, just land. You know, just flying around and around and around and around, right? OK, so there are 40,000 people then. They took off with 7,000 pounds of fuel. They landed with 106. Now, they did go faster out of the Caribbean than was necessary. But they didn't realize they had you know, leaking tanks and things were going to blow. Okay, So they used 98.48% of their fuel. It was uh, 18.3 gallons when they were done. So they're in the hangar now, a very famous hangar uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. That's uh, Burt Rutan talking about uh, the wings there. And you know that close-up look you wanted to get of the wings? You're one of the few in the world. Oh, here you go. This is saying there's no rules. They broke all the rules when they did this. They deceived Edwards Air Force Base. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know what we're doing. This is all real safe, and this is going to be cool. Don't worry about it. It's really cool, right? They knew it was high, high, very high risk, potentially people getting killed. They did it anyway. And Bert was always amazed that nobody ever said, are you sure this can be done? Why don't you show me in paper? Right? And his little brother said, if he said it could be done, it would do it. So there's this trust that's involved in, in, in this kind of thing. So there it is. You're one of the few people to ever see the wing this close. This is it. Uh, that's the real deal. Okay? That's sort of like those servers that your founders had that are over in the computer museum, you know, that are they're, you know, they're all kind of like bit, you know, you know, laying in there because they're unsupported. Right? That's right. Okay. So Bruce, the main guy, says there's no way this airplane ever should have made it. Don't fly it again. Dick says, well, we've got to get it from Edwards Air Force Base back to Mojave. He says, OK, take it off. Don't turn anything on. Just take off, pull up, left hand turn, land it. Okay. So they do that, and they take some pictures. And on the way in, right over the runway to the Mojave, they notice that the coolant seal had completely failed up to the last heartbeat. So there it is. It's um, hanging there. Uh, they didn't clean it up. To this day, nobody knows why the fuel was, fly was flowing backwards. I've actually talked with Dick Rutan about it. I, I, I have my suspicions why I did. Um, but uh, nobody knows. He was going to go into the airplane one last time and look around in the fuel system to figure it out. And um, the next thing he knew, it was on the way to the Smithsonian. OK, so here's some takeaways, guys. Devices versus a product. Can you, take, can, can you use a clunky thing and scale it up? Okay. Voyager, as designed, was a highly compromised device for range. That's what it did. It had no strength. It had no other redeeming qualities. Bert Rutan has, has, uh, uh, Bert Rutan has designed three airplanes that have attempted to go commercial, industrial strength. Here's how it worked out. Voyager was a complete success, uncontested to success. Nobody made a nickel. The guys that tried to make a nickel, Raytheon Beechcraft Starship, had an absolute catastrophic failure. They built like 60 of them. 55 of them are out in the, the Tucson desert and Evergreen aircraft waiting to get cut up and destroyed. Okay. Visionaire was another one. Uh, per dollar debt. Uh, uh, you know, VC money, they, they, they returned 1.2 on the sale to some outfit down in uh, 1.2 cents on, on the sale. And Adam Aircraft is yet another one that's trying it right now. And I actually know this uh, gentleman that, that's president of that company, and the jury's out, but they've uh, slipped and slipped and slipped. And every time you read their press announcements, and I have them all, it's like uh, real soon now here, and we're working, and we expect, and none of it has come to me. Because the problem is not the device, the problem is injecting the device into an existing world. You know, this fractal base, multi dimensional, nonlinear world with feedback loops subject to discontinuities, exhibiting tectonic shifts, subject to effects of time and scale. That one, okay? Is it, is it his fault that this happened? No. It's a really big world. 
If somebody says, hey, it's a really small world, isn't it? You know they have immediately identified themselves as somebody that lives in a very small corner of a large world. Okay. So here are some observations. We can't go through all of them. I'm not sure. Uh, 43? Yeah, maybe we can. You know, I, 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 guess the, um, I guess the statement is entropy never sleeps. To counteract against entropy requires eternal vigilance. And uh, you'll, you'll find it here. You'll see, you'll, you'll see it here, too. OK. Um, you better have a good team unless you know everything. And, and I flunked on that one. You know. Of 100 people in the ground, two are going to be in the air. And that, that's quite often. You know, Rock bands, there's five guys up on stage, and there's a road crew. You know, football team, 15 guys on the field, and there's 50,000 spectators. Okay. Real, real Silicon Valley bootstraps are generally harrowing hardcore experiences unless a fashion event happens and when you're suddenly cool and the thing takes off. But your guys that lived in a garage, they earned it. They earned it. Okay? Don't expect people to be excited about what you're excited about. Even though it's worthy of excitement, it's a bad plan to bet on it. You know? Just expect that they're not going to share it, and that way you won't be disappointed. You shouldn't be discouraged. Just expect it, because it takes perseverance and 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 uh, uh, aggressiveness. So spectators don't win. You got to show up to play, right? Um, boldness is in short supply. If you've got an idea that you really think is good, here's a notion: go out and sell it yourself. Boy, you'll, you'll get a real education real fast as to how big the world is and how many viewpoints. I don't think this is a big problem here at Google as it is at a lot of other places. Want to be successful? Be willing to be thrown out of a lot of really nice places. Now, I come to a place like this, and I really like these places. I never know what the reception is going to be or if I'm going to get thrown out. But you just got to go do it. Okay? Ain't over till it's over, Yogi Berra. Um, all kinds of things can happen. And when a precipitous thing happens, it's very important to understand that you won't know for some time whether it's for the best or for the worst. Okay? Um, surprises and failure are different concepts. Okay? Do not equate a surprise with a failure. It's best to know what the definition of success is before you embark on a very expensive program. And um, you're going to find it's a journey, not a destination. I think there's a saying that says, success is never final. Defeat is never fatal. It's got to get up. Do it. OK. Sometimes inexpensive commodity components are good, and sometimes they're not. <laughs> right? Sometimes they're not. Um, it all depends. Devices and products are very different things. So all those Voyager design surprises, Anybody know about Sophocles? Great, great quote from Sophocles here, one that I try and live by. You go and do it. And you screw up as soon as possible so that you can fix it. And the screw ups aren't mistakes generally. They are surprises, things that were unknown, things that were in those dimensions that you were unaware of when you started out. Okay? Now. I'd rather be lucky than good. Were these guys lucky? Oh, yeah. They were lucky. OK. Remember Luck's roll. These are 19, 18 or 19 things here, any one of which could have either killed everybody or stopped it right in its tracks. They didn't happen. It's also the same with startups in the valley and efforts and initiatives and things like that. There are a number of things in this big world that can snuff you out in a heartbeat. They may not show up to play. Right? It's sort of like AND gates. You're going to go, you're going to traverse a bunch of AND gates, and there's a whole bunch of them that aren't in the chain. So you may get through. You don't know. And when you get through and you get down, you can do something else on the other side. So now I have two more slides. Uh, I think the next one is the Stanford closing slide, that I, the Stanford presentation that I gave in, in uh, well, actually, yeah, three more slides. These are some links that you may be interested in. Dick Rutan, he's a really good speaker. And if you search on him, he said dickrutan.com. The EAA is uh, eaa.org. 
they sponsor a youth organization called Young Eagles. And I had the permission for the Stanford presentation to use their pictures. And that's where these Voyager pictures came from. If you have children that are interested in aviation, this is the place to start. Hiller Museum up in uh, San Carlos is also a good place. They have activities for kids and things like that. And it's really a very fascinating deal. Uh, some of the photography is taken by Mark Greenberg, a gentleman I know, uh, flightclassics.com. Now I've got two more slides, I'm pretty sure. So this is it. Okay, this is not the closing slide. So this is the end of the, of the Stanford presentation that I gave. You know, thank you, cleared for takeoff and Godspeed for um, uh, on your journey. So here's the last slide. This is a, this is a Google bonus slide that I made last night for you guys. Here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I like you. This is good. This is good. Yeah, yeah, I got your attention. He didn't sleep. I love it. OK, so here, see, maybe I lied. <laughs> maybe the speaker lied. OK, all right. So everybody looks at innovation, right? And they think it's on a big whiteboard. It's not. There's all kinds of social forces and existing technologies and everything else that's wrapped around it, right? What did Machiavelli say? Something about there's nothing more difficult to take in hand than change and more uncertain than its outcome. Oh, yeah, it's a real deal. For all kinds of reasons that you're not going to be able to anticipate because of that world I talked about, you know, that, that multidimensional thing, right? Figure out what tomorrow is, is a exercise in calculus of variations with respect to non-variant, uh, uh, calculus of variations with respect to, uh, you know, multivariate manifold analysis. It's real tough, right? You're out in the choppy sea. Now, there's a theory, last statement, that we are six degrees away from everybody else in the world, right? Here, the six degree theory, okay? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that are one degree away from innovation. One degree. Now, i got to double. Come on, talk to daddy. There they are. Ah, you got it. OK. Yes, you did. OK. So I've trained you. Right? And, and, and all good training programs have a graduation exercise, right? Have a graduation exercise. And here's a graduation exercise, right? Innovation, survival, right? Concept, courage, and change. And there's all these words written around here. So if you want to graduate, you got to do the graduation thing. You got to bounce the ball around. That's it. And read a word. That's it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience, and I'll give you your 10 bucks. Come on. Thank you very much.